good evening everyone um, thank you for joining us for this uh, book discussion which is on one belt one road chinese power meets the world uh, this book has been authored by ike freiman who is a dfil candidate at university of, of, of oxford and also an indo pacific director at green mantle i'm joined by three very esteemed panelists uh, first is dr sana hashmi who is a visiting fellow at taiwan asia exchange foundation in taipei uh second is dipanjan roy choudhury who is a diplomatic editor at the economic times and my colleague kalpit emanikar who is a fellow at orf strategic studies program um so as one can see one belt one road uh, it's a very timely discussion given that it uh, so much of discussion that it has generated in all global platforms scholarly uh, community everywhere uh, an initiative that started off as an economic infrastructure de development invent from the chinese side but we can see that in the long it does have strategic connotations as well as economic ones um to discuss on this more i would like to invite uh, ike to discuss about his book where he has outlined how we uh, the general narrative that goes on to show how the west is presenting the views which the west is presenting about the belt and road or one belt one road which is very clearly underlined why he uses the term one belt one road in his book is not a way to counter the chinese initiative and he has laid out some very valuable policy recommendations which i would leave for him to address in this discussion uh, so with this i would like to uh, give the floor to ike please go ahead and give us some insight into your book well thank you permission for that kind introduction um thank you to uh the distinguished panelists for uh zooming in to join us today and uh thank you to the ORF um one of the think tanks that i admire most uh the most influential think tank in india working on these issues uh, for inviting me to share my research with you today i'm going to take about uh 10 or 12 minutes i'm going to introduce the the main ideas from the book and i'm also going to make some observations about uh where we stand coming out of the covid-19 pandemic uh western attempts to compete with the belt and road and specifically what this means for south asia and for india's neighborhood i came to write this book uh because in 2015 i was in beijing doing uh a research fellowship at uh, the carnegie chinghua center at one of china's leading universities at a think tank jointly run uh with the carnegie endowment in washington dc and i was struck by the fact that this was a summer of great tumult and chaos inside china the financial markets were melting down it looked like this might be the beginning of the end of the chinese economic miracle and yet every night on chinese state television uh commentators were coming out to pronounce their grand optimism about this itai ilu one belt one road initiative and i was struck by the fact that the communist party seemed to be doubling down on this even at a time of crisis even though it was a long term highly speculative enterprise that involved investing huge amounts of money overseas rather than solving domestic problems inside china and it seemed to me that if china was doubling down on this in a time of crisis this must be something that was politically uh, central to the legacy of xi jinping himself and at, which had buy in from all quarters within the communist party I decided that this was an elevator going up. This was not just another Chinese slogan, and this was something that was worth consideration because it might be around for a long time. So now as it looks like Xi Jinping is getting ready to transition to his third term in power, I think it's worth reconsidering the Belt and Road because it is after all his legacy project, the initiative most closely connected to his own name. Uh, at the last party congress it was written into the national party constitution alongside Xi Jinping thought so it's worth asking what one belt one road means to a chinese audience uh, what china is actually trying to do through this initiative at the same time as we ask what is actually happening on the ground in the partner countries that work with china so the way i approach this book is as a diagnostic exercise. The question is if you are a policymaker in a leading western country, I'm writing mainly for the United States but for India as well. 
if you're trying to understand what this is, how it affects your national interests, and therefore how you should respond, you should proceed in an organized way. And first you need to understand what this is inside China, where it comes from, what it means, what the relevant institutions are, and then you have to understand what the patterns are on the ground and how that affects your interests. So let's take the first part first. Uh, the Belt and Road concept preceded Xi Jinping. This idea of rebuilding an ancient Silk Road, of using Silk Road as a metaphor for uh, economic exchanges between China and its neighbors, this has been around since the 1970s and it has been in frequent use in China since the early 2000s. So Xi Jinping appropriated a slogan that already existed and he attached it to a model of infrastructure development and state lending uh, that had been developed also by his predecessors. So this was not new. And in the process of rolling out the One Belt, One Road scheme between, say, 2013 and 2016, a large number of projects that had been initiated under Xi's predecessors were folded into the initiative. So Xi Jinping could, could take credit for money that had already been spent or committed. Uh, in the process, there was propaganda, there were conferences, there were films, uh, universities were encouraged to set up think tanks, and the entire Chinese party state was rallied around this concept to the point that provinces, cities, state-owned enterprises, private enterprises were issuing their own Belt and Road plans. And so while this was presented as a, an organized top-down initiative, it actually was administered more from the bottom up. Uh, the central government would send signals about what basically it was trying to do. Silk Road was supposed to be a metaphor for mutual cooperation, for investments overseas, uh, for people-to-people -people exchanges, but it was largely left to local companies, local administrators, people pretty far down on the food chain to decide how they wanted to twist that slogan uh, to fit their aims of their, of their own personal aims and the aims of their organization. One of the tricky things uh, about trying to understand the Belt and Road, to measure the Belt and Road, is that particularly in its early years, it was very shambolic and poorly managed. So you had uh, individuals, uh, for example, the Chinese billionaire Huang Nubo goes to Iceland and thinks, well, what if I buy a large section of land in the north of Iceland? This could be of strategic use to China in the future. I have political connections here. I'll take a loss in the short term, but I'll signal my loyalty to Xi Jinping. By all accounts, Huang was not acting with uh, at the explicit instruction of the Chinese Communist Party. He simply believed that he was furthering the national strategy in some way. And that's why it's very difficult when local uh, Icelandic politicians and regulators were trying to assess his offer for them to figure out to what extent he was actually uh, acting on at the behest of the party and to what extent he was just a lone actor who thought he could get approval or favor uh, back at home. Over the course of the last five years, uh, this has changed. There has been a realization in Beijing that a poorly coordinated effort will actually reflect badly on China because many projects will uh, be approved that are not destined to make money uh, because uh, it will make it easier for foreign powers like India and the United States to pick out individual projects and use them uh, to represent the entire initiative. And there has been a recognition that Chinese banks are probably going to lose quite a bit of money. And so uh, in the last five years, but particularly since about 2018, there has been an effort to standardize Belt and Road projects, to put them under a single managerial hierarchy. And you have seen the leading small group, uh, which is responsible for overseeing the Belt and Road, and the National Development and Reform Commission in Beijing um, emerge as the most important administrative bodies. So going forward, particularly out of the pandemic, you are not going to see highly speculative loss-making, debt-trap type projects. This is becoming a much more disciplined, a much more focused initiative. Uh, it is looking at things like public health and vaccines, uh, tech platforms, perhaps green technology. Uh, it's going to be much more about trade uh, than infrastructure. So that, that is the first point that I would make. There has been a, a general trend towards more centralization and more discipline. And that means that Belt and Road post-pandemic is going to look very different than it did pre-pandemic.
Uh, but the second point I want to talk about, which is probably the most important theme developed in my book, is what happens when recipient countries interact with the Belt and Road. When this was first introduced in the mid-2000s, it was basically just a slogan. Uh, but it has become clearer over time that for uh, politicians and political parties in China's partner countries, speaking China's language, invoking the slogan of Belt and Road, often comes with political favors. And the Belt and Road has evolved into something more like a patronage network, in which uh, by talking about the slogan, by talking up Chinese projects, whether or not they are actually funded or built, uh, local politicians can get Chinese backing uh, to entrench their interests at home and hedge against regional rivals. And this makes it very difficult for the United States or India or anyone else to compete with what China is offering. Because as the value proposition of this has become clearer, um, it's not just money for a power plant or a high voltage transmission line or an airport or a railroad that China is offering. What they're really offering is political backing and protection. And for a country like Nepal or a country like Sri Lanka, this can actually be a very attractive value proposition because their entire strategic doctrine is about getting leverage over India and preventing India from interfering in their domestic politics. So where, does we, where do we stand coming out of the pandemic? Clearly, China has reined in its foreign lending. We are not going to see a return to the orgy of speculative investment that we saw in the early 2000s. From India's perspective, that's probably a good thing because to many countries in India's neighborhood, like Bangladesh, China has a lot less to offer now than it did five years ago. But the Belt and Road is not gone. In fact, we could argue that it's evolving to become much more sophisticated and to offer a much more attractive value proposition to partner countries. Uh, gone are the days that in order to get Chinese attention, a uh, recipient country politician would have to sign up for a multi-billion dollar speculative venture that had some probability of turning into a debt trap. Now all they have to do is join by video conference, a virtual seminar in which they're lectured about the virtues of cooperation by a Chinese diplomat. They don't even have to attend the Belt and Road Forum in Beijing in person. And that's why at the last uh, Asia Pacific uh, Belt and Road uh, business conference, nearly all of India's neighbors, all of the SARC countries uh, dialed in. So I think this is a long-term strategic challenge for India. It risks seeing itself encircled as the various countries in its neighborhood seek to hedge against Indian influence by forming closer ties with China. And as this initiative becomes less about investment and more about trade, the short-term immediate rewards that will accrue to a partner country from joining this initiative are, I think, going to become more and more attractive. So this is a story that is evolving, but it is a story that is very important for India's long-term strategic rivalry with China. And I can think of no better place to have this conversation than through the ORF. So I will stop there and thank you for listening. And I'm, I look forward to having a conversation about some of these ideas. Uh, thank you, Ike. I think um, those were some observations um, which we are not reading much yet about. Uh, as I, as very open, during my opening remarks, I made it clear that you have come up with, when you're talking about the narrative that is going around about the Belt and Road, you're presenting some fresh ideas, which is putting forward some fresh inputs, which I think are uh, if not uh, found anywhere much because of the lack of uh, reading of the primary sources or the Chinese sources, which is usually lies at the bottom of these problems. Um, I would uh, ask you a few questions later, but uh, before that, I would um, like to open the floor to uh, the other panelists, beginning with Dr. Sana Hash. Thank you, Premsha and ORF for inviting me for this book discussion. Um, I let me congratulate you for such a timely piece of work. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book, uh, and I really like how you divided your book into two sections. The first section is mainly the rationale behind the Belt and Road Initiative, and how uh, you have paid considerable attention to the domestic determinants. I think it's very important, even before we talk about the external repercussions, we have to really take into consideration what other uh, domestic, what have been the domestic determinants. 
Um, and the second section carefully deals with the countries, uh, regions where the BRI, where China has got tangible gains or China has made mistakes. Um, so you have taken case studies that has made what the BRI is today. And it is so crucial to highlight that how these countries are willingly partnering and acting according to their own needs and interests. Um, and in the end, you have drawn conclusion as to what the West could do to deal with the BRI, uh, as most of the Western countries aren't a part of it. I think it's a very good structure and it's very important for uh, scholars on China and BRI to read your book. Uh, so uh, you made several crucial points in your book. And one important point that needs careful discussion is that when we talk about countries' participation, the host countries and the smaller countries' participation uh, and the debt trap, we also have to take into consideration the needs of these countries as well. Uh, and you mentioned that China isn't really preying on these victims, the host countries. Uh, the countries from different continents are willing to partner with China on the Belt and Road Initiative. And China has consolidated its domestic as well as economic profile in countries across Asia, uh, Africa, and Europe through the effective use of the Belt and Road Initiative. And, uh, but then it's also important for us to consider that the several host countries have renegotiated the terms of the Belt and Road Initiative project. And we have an example of Malaysia here. It's not that the host countries are not really have to stay here. Um, and we also have to uh, look at how the smaller countries are negotiating with China, renegotiating with China. Then different countries view the Belt and Road Initiative differently. And it is, uh, I completely agree with you, it's com according to their interest and their relationship with China. Uh, the Belt and Road Forum has served as a platform for China to project the so-called credibility of the BRI and the rise in the number of the participant countries across the world testifies this. Uh, then also while the US, Japan, Australia, India, they often signal that the BRI is an initiative with revisionist motives, uh, but the countries such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Cambodia, they tend to see it, they tend to perceive it very differently. So I think it's a very important point that we really need to highlight again and again when we have this discourse on the Belt and Road Initiative. Also, several scholars have failed to pay enough attention to the domestic compulsions that you I have covered extensively in your book. Um, then in your book, you've also talked about China using countries' rivalry for gaining support for the BRI. You also mentioned this briefly in your talk. Uh, like it is some kind of uh, leverage to the host countries against a geopolitical threat. You talked about uh, India's neighborhood. You talked about Sri Lanka and Nepal. Uh, but when we talk about Sri Lanka, China's BRI investment are strong. And But I think that India's neighborhood and countries such as Sri Lanka, they aren't really entirely overlooking India. Uh, of course, India plays a very, very important role. And in Sri Lanka, there's a need to, well, especially in Nepal, there's a need to balance out India. And China is a very important alternative in this context. Uh, but the Sri Lanka is also diversifying its infrastructural needs. India and Japan, they are jointly developing this Columbus West Container Terminal. So these are the examples which we also have to take into consideration. I think more than uh, China uh, using these rivalries against uh, uh, India and other countries, I think these countries also have their own needs. And it's, they're also looking for different alternatives and they're also diversifying their needs. Uh, then you also uh, talked about Russia in similar context, Russia, US, and Russia's participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I really don't think that Russia's cal calculation for the Belt and Road Initiative include the US that much. It isn't that much of a factor. Uh, several scholars have talked about uh, Russia. They have described Russia as a gatekeeper for the BRI project in the wider Eurasian region and how uh, Russia is so insecure about China surpassing Russia in Central Asia and the wider Eurasian region. The fact you have also mentioned in your book, in fact, uh, but um, I think it's uh, more than the U.S. factor. Uh, in Russia's immediate neighborhood, the bigger threat for Russia is China's potential to surpass Russia, and now specifically with the Belt and Road Initiative. And in fact, within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as well, Russia has been obstructing China's proposal for several economic initiatives. So, And uh, we also have to take into consideration that no other country is better 
position to obstruct China's Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. So I believe that more than Russia needs China, it is China that needs Russia's cooperation specifically with the Belt and Road Initiative in Eurasia. So uh, uh, in fact, the scholar Bobolo, he talked about China-Russia cooperation and he called this uh, cooperation as an excess of convenience. So I think it is more based on the convenience, it's more based on their own needs and their national interests. Then uh, one of your policy recommendations is that the, the US and its partner should join the Belt and Road Initiative and so that they could co-op before China uh, and before it could turn it into a geopolitical bloc. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the US and other countries, I think in its current form, uh, form uh, from uh, what, what China has been doing is nothing even close to elevating the concerns of the countries that are opposing the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think in this uh, current situation, it is actually not feasible for the US and its partner, including India, to join the Belt and Road Initiative. The lack of transparency is there. There's no clear definition, even after uh, seven more than seven years, China hasn't really defined what comes under Belt and Road Initiative and what doesn't come under Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so I think this remains a problem. And there is, of course, corruption in most countries. We have seen Central Asia, we have seen Pakistan. So I think this is also marked by corruption. Uh, so I think these factors are very important when we talk about uh, democracy's participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and when we talk about India, so India was the first country to voice its opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative. And India, India is one of the few countries that have officially protested against the Belt and Road Initiative, cited sovereignty issues. It objects to the China-Pakistan economic corridor that passes through the disputed territory between India and Pakistan. Uh, so China's presence and investment in uh, uh, POK, it actually worries India, but then not participating so in uh, non-participation of these countries, I believe, will pose a challenge to the BRI in the long run as well. And India's refusal to join the BRI has become a major hurdle in China's goal of making the BRI a pan-Asian initiative. For China, I think it is very important uh, that it makes concession even before these countries come and join the Belt and Road Initiative. And in fact, you also call this as uh, an imperfect solution. Uh, but the point here is that uh, if you look at Xi's policies now, there's hardly any sign for accommodation and concession. So that has a lot to do with the CCP's 100th anniversary and with Xi being the president for life. And there are several other domestic as well as external factors that have been involved. Uh, but for countries that are opposing the Belt and Road Initiative, they're presenting an alternative now. So Japan has been very active with the Enhanced Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. Recently, there is the uh, 3W and to address the security implications, the revival of the quadrilateral security dialogue has the potential to play a greater role here. Uh, but of course, we have to wait and watch how committed these countries uh, that are involved would be and what would be the long term impact and effectiveness of these policies. But uh, as you rightly mentioned in your book, and you just mentioned that BRI is uh, going to stay, there is a mixed response to BRI, and I think. Uh, this is one of the major reasons why BRI is going to stay here. And for countries that are opposed to the BRI, I think writing it off would be a little premature for these countries. Um, and I believe that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, very likely to position China as the formidable power in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Those were some um, very insightful thoughts, uh, actually. You presented the Indian view very uh, nicely, and you also mentioned how uh, democracies uh, have a lot of the factors to look into uh, before thinking of joining an initiative like this, and transparency being uh, one. Actually, uh, I have I have a related question, but um, I think let me bring in the other panelists first, uh, Mr. Roy Choudhury. Can you hear? Uh, I think the book is very well timed, you know, as I uh, flipped through, you know, some of your arguments there, and particularly uh, in the post pandemic uh, situation and the way uh, you explained also, you know, it, it would limit uh, China's uh, or, or it is readjusting its uh, BRI goals. Uh, I would like to, you know, point out a couple of uh, areas where you could focus probably or look closely uh, later because you, you are also working. 
um, uh, in as part of your PhD, if I understand correctly, in China in the Arctic. Uh, you know, a critical area and which Sana would uh, and, Prem, and, and Premisha would also, you know, have worked closely is, is Southeast Asia, you know. And I'm talking about Southeast Asia because, you know, it's in the India's extended neighborhood. I think this area is critical because if China is readjusting its belt and road, and as we can see, it's actually going to focus a lot more in the Southeast Asia. A, that this part of Indo-Pacific uh, is, is the growth story. You know, unlike uh, the Eurasian states, uh, and that includes even Iran, that's one. Uh, and uh, the, also that this is uh, an uh, area which is, which is in China's neighborhood with strong diaspora population, including in Malaysia, where Mahathir had sought to reverse or, 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 or you know, change the terms and conditions of some of the projects. But, but after Mahathir uh, was forced out of power, you know, the new prime minister is again crying, crying, kind of uh, ooh, ooh China. So, so China is going to be, you know, its BRI and its kind of, you know, its in through uh, influence with its BRI is going to expand in Southeast Asia. Or rather, they were going to focus uh, into Southeast Asia first as a regional power, you know, in its, in its quest for readjustment to the other parts of the world. And here lies the biggest challenge uh, for several countries uh, in the region as well as outside the region because ASEAN is divided, right? Uh, so we see Australia trying to, you know, increase its footprint uh, with, uh, with the global good in this region. Uh, but Australia alone cannot be able to, you know, match the Chinese uh, influence. We also see Japan coming in, 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 uh, in this region. But Japan, uh, while Japan has a lot of uh, financial muscle, I, it's yet to devil, uh, transform that financial muscle into an economic, a geopolitical strategy, unlike the US. And we have India, we are very suited, uh, very well placed. And as uh, Sana also mentioned, uh, uh, the, the couple of factors which prevented India from joining Belt and Road and probably, and was the only major country which did not join Belt and Road. And today, many countries are, are rather voicing what India had said in 2016 and 17. And uh, but you know our financial muscle is not as strong as you know Japan or or US or Australia, and somewhere I feel that the US has left ground open for China to push in in this region. So from come Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, China is now pushing into you know uh, into South Asia, and they already have you know Bangladesh may not be as vulnerable as Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka it, 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 with its geographic position offers them. Uh, you know, it's an island. It doesn't have a land geography, so it it really is is something which is served on a plate for China, right? So, and then come Maldives. You know, where Maldives, the government is resisting Chinese influence in the last three years, and from there, China is going to relatively, uh, you know, less influential place where it has less influence, which is the Western Indian Ocean. But recently, and as I have uh, reported also that. Uh, you know, Tanzania on the east, eastern coast of Africa uh, has revived the uh, plan of a port, which was shelved by the last Thai, uh, Tanzanian president, uh, but he passed away recently, as we all know, from COVID. He was treated in Kenya, and uh, there were some complications with his health. So the president passes away uh, a, a month back, comes a new president, she talks with Xi Jinping, and the project is revived. This is going to be a, probably a na second naval base for China after Djibouti, you know, because the, the, the biggest problem with with, uh, with with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and which you also had mentioned in your book, is that the lack of stated objectives. You know, if India does a project or US does a project, you know, you know, I'm not getting into the Cold War where well, the politics that US played in various parts of the world and the USs are matched. I'm not getting into that. But there is a lack of larger lack of transparency with 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 what we associate with US. But if China is, is doing a port project, and what I'm saying, this port is a very critical port, airport is a very critical infrastructure project, you know, like the telecom sector. It doesn't state its objective. And what it tries to do in the process is that it, it makes its own, it dictates the government that you uh, will not uh, shape the policy in this particular region. So it becomes Chinese enclave. A Chinese enclave in a sovereign country thousands of kilometers away from China. Right, and it uh, and from there, if it's a Chinese enclave, it will actually we don't know what happens there, you know. So they will make a naval 
outpost, a base from where they have been able to control the ocean regions. And that Tanzania would not be very far from Oman, you know, uh, because Zanzibar was part of Oman at some point of in history. Mauritius and Seychelles are nearby, where which have India has uh, strong ties, and the France has also its assets. So there will be a time that if the Chinese can play right, they are going to challenge you know many powers in the region, regional powers, global powers in this part of the world. Then you come to you know Latin America, where US has been a supreme power. Okay, there are ideological differences. You have different governments, but look at the countries, the way they have, but the China has used some of the you know. Uh, the, the, the lack of uh, dialogue between U.S. and those countries or lack of government uh, of understanding with U.S. and those countries and sort of made penetration, including in Chile. Chile, while it uh, you know, uh, is, is a long-standing partner of uh, U.S., right? Uh, uh, generally, a country which has right of the center politics, right? Today, you know, uh, the Sinopharm, that the Chileans went and used Sinopharm and they said, oh, it's a success, but now there are doubts about that, right? So look at Chile and also look at Hungary in Europe, you know, because why I'm saying Chile and Hungary? Because these are the two countries which had relative growth in the last 30 years after the 1990, one out of the coming out of dictatorial, one coming after the Iron Curtain fall. Look at the way China has targeted these countries. Very, very strategic. The biggest holdout in Europe is Hungary. Today, when Joe Biden has reached out to Europe and Europe is reciprocating, right? And many countries have got confidence in that. But there are a couple of holdouts. I don't know what is the US uh, plan idea for Latin America because the Chinese are quietly coming. It has huge mineral resources. But if the US feels that if it still controls, uh, you know, Latin America in a way it did, you know, and, and that doesn't have political outreach there, it might soon be a Belt and Road in the U.S. backyard. And they're already connecting, if you if you would know better than me, between the Pacific and the Atlantic through the Panama Canal, right? So these are trends, and they are playing for long. You know, this is the 100 year of Chinese Communist Party. They are looking for 100 years of the revolution, which is 2049, you know. So it's a long, if the Chinese economy can grow at the rate it is growing, and, and 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 its national comprehensive power and and there's no uh, you know break on its national comprehensive power. We have a real drop in in the room. It's it's not just you know uh, uh, a kind of a power, but but that is going to change the geoeconomics and geopolitics, and and they will capture you know they have already started capturing UN institutions one by one. This is not the way probably U.S. would have, you know, at one point of time had its own people, you know, and an unwritten rule. But this is through the layer of money, through the layer of influence, by literally putting gun uh, on somebody's head. And I don't want to name, you know, in a recent kind of appointment, which happened in, the, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a global organization, not uh, U.N. So if you control this, you know, and Belt and Road will probably be the tool to control this. So maybe your next or, or the third project on Belt and Road, you can focus on how the Chinese... Are, are furthering the Belt and Road through the global institutions. And what is the long-term goal of Belt and Road, even if they readjust after the pandemic, you know? Because, you, you know, you study closely China, you have been uh, visiting. You saw how, how their economy didn't get so much affected, right? And there are questions which are getting raised, right? You know, Look at Indian economy in the last two years. We have been hit badly, right? We come out, you know, uh, we build our capacity. And by the time, how much does China progresses, right? Maybe we can only hope that China doesn't grow at a fast pace for the next 10 years. So in that process, we can do catching up, right? And, uh, 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 you know, uh, and close the gap. Only when, you know, uh, the alternative is offered, like it is being done, and these projects, uh, the alternative projects are implemented on time, right? Of course, it is being done in a transparent in the US, Japan, Japan in particular, you India in particular, US will do it in a transparent manner and so will Australia. Fast pace of this and 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 how, how slow the Chinese economy grows. Maybe you can look at this, maybe you can do on the paper on this and, um, and 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 probably join hands with the ORF and do a joint collaboration with that. And then you know that can could be really um, uh, uh, could really be an eye opener for for larger audience. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. I uh, especially like the fact that you uh, asked Ike to look at how OBOR is uh, benefiting the global institutions. And I think you spoke correctly about uh, Southeast Asia. We, we can see how Chinese investments and also the Chinese economic dependence of countries on, of Southeast Asia, how that in a way is affecting the ASEAN centrality and also mm. the ASEAN way and the ASEAN um, unity. unity, right? So uh, probably, uh, yeah, that is a very valid point to look into. Um, with that, I would like to invite uh, Kalpit. I think, uh, firstly, congratulations to I for uh, you know, having this brought brought out this very uh, topical book, uh, they say a good book is one that you know talks directly to its audience, and uh, I think this book succeeds in doing that. I am particularly interested in the domestic narratives of the CCP, mm. and uh, this book, uh, you know, I really situates the whole domestic narrative that the CCP has tried to create, you know, within China. I mean, this may be through rewriting uh, school textbooks that emphasize China's historic leadership. I mean, the whole imperial uh, dynasties in, um, you know, shaping the whole uh, Silk Route trade. Then uh, Zheng He, uh, the 15th century Ming uh, dynasty admiral who has been resurrected. Uh, now, this is, of course, to kind of show that, you know, China is, uh, this is a messaging to people that uh, China has always believed in a very peaceful commercial trade. Now, um, this book is, um, I found it very topical because uh, of, uh, for, for, for certain reasons, uh, you had President Biden meet with the G7 leaders to discuss how to compete with China strategically. And out of this was born the whole Build Back Better World. Now, this really seeks to fulfill the huge demand for infrastructure that exists in uh, low and middle income nations. So somewhere there is an acknowledgement that, you know, the US has to get into the whole game to counter China's fear of influence in this, uh, you know, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, angle. Now, uh, very interestingly, what does China do? Now, in response to the uh, G7, China recently convened a meeting on BRI. Now, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi makes some very, very interesting comments on this. He says BRI is not really limited to the economy, but it is becoming a platform for global for improving global governance. Now we'll come to this later. He talks about you know that the U.S. I mean he's he's addressing this to the 27 uh, partner nations, the BRI partners, but very significantly he says that you know the U.S. has to accommodate different civilizations and different systems now you know what is the china's what is china's view of the global governance system they always felt that the global governance system was a direct outcome of the distribution of powers in the 1940s between you know two the whole two blocks and the chinese feel that you know powerful nations really got uh, you know designed global institutions and rules to reflect and further their own national interests now, since the United States and the Western nations designed many of, uh, you know, the multilateral institutions in uh, of today, you know, China, and, and this is when China was very weak. I mean, this is this is a recurrent narrative that China was very weak, and you know, China assumes that you know the benefits of these systems really accrue to Western nations, and this has come at China's expense. Now, Chinese observers again view the Brexit referendum and, you know, Trump's Donald Trump's uh, isolationist foreign policy as, you know, a kind of a, a kind of a evidence that, you know, the world's oldest and most uh, powerful democracies have somewhere lost the plot. Now, this again has created an opening for China to play, uh, you know, a, 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 a stronger role in global governance issues. Now, in uh, June 2018, President Xi Jinping makes a very important speech, and he says that you know China will lead the whole reform of global governance, uh, uh, the system of global governance. Now, this uh, came immediately after Trump 
President Trump, uh, you know, withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal and from the Human Rights Council. Now, this is, I, in my view, that marks a huge divergence in China's official narrative that, you know, don't claim, uh, uh, I mean, the principle enunciated by Deng Xiaoping that you should not claim leadership. You see, uh, the point is that, you know, China recognizes that, you know, in order to continue advancing economically, it cannot really wall off uh, people in China from the global community. But integrating with a global system that requires that that values liberal principles over authoritarian uh, principles, you know, poses a sizable risk. You know, it exposes Chinese citizens to a set of ideals and uh, there are benefits which the current leadership does not want to, it does not intend to meet. And to address this risk somewhere, I think Chinese leaders seek to make an international system which is more like China. And this is, uh, this is opposite to what Western nations really intended when they brought in China into the system. So I think, you know, when China talks about making the international order more open and diverse, it is really pitching for authoritarian, uh, you know, its brand of authoritarianism on a par with, you know, the values of a liberal democracy. So, and I think BRI is a, a conduit to do this. Now, again, uh, Wang Yi uh, has made the same point. I mean, he talks about, he says that China does not seek to impose any political conditions. Now, look at what the Chinese ambassador, uh, he was addressing a gathering in uh, Bangladesh. And he says that, you know, Dhaka will, uh, you know, there will be a significant risk to its relationship uh, with Beijing if it warms up to the Quad. Now, you know, on one hand, China is uh, extremely touchy about issues of uh, regarding sovereignty, its own sovereignty. and and its own territorial integrity and you know but you know china doesn't really have uh, any forms of attaching any political conditions to with respect to bangladesh's foreign policy now lastly i'd like to conclude with a small personal uh, experience of mine regarding bri during my visit to sri lanka i was a part of a delegation of journalists and we were driving down from sigiria which is uh, slightly it's it's uh, you know it's in the hinterland and this is from Sigiria to Colombo. Now at two places, I saw road construction activity. They were building a road and this was, uh, this was a Chinese company which was uh, had the contract. And I mean, we, we just disembarked and we saw that most of these laborers who were in, uh, employed at the uh, project, you know, their hands had been chained to each other. Now, I mean, it seemed that, you know, these were prison laborers. So I kind of tried to ask my hosts and I asked some of the public representatives whom we interfaced with. And, uh, you know, I really got very, very evasive answers. Uh, but off the record, I think uh, many of them admitted that this was, uh, you know, this was really standard practice. So I think uh, to conclude, I think the, the labor practices of BRI need a, a much greater scrutiny from uh, the academic community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kalpit. Uh, I think we have a few questions from our participants. Uh, I'll address them one by one. Uh, but before that, I'll, um, let's say, in collaboration with that or in addition to those questions, uh, there are one or two things that I would like uh, you to ponder upon more, probably. Um, one, as you mentioned uh, before this discussion began, that you had to uh, update a few information given the ongoing pandemic. So uh, during the course of the pandemic, we've seen uh, the term Health Silk Road being used quite often. So if you can uh, tell us a little more on that, and also I would like to hear your views on the Polar Silk Road uh, on which you're researching currently as well. Secondly is, um, I would like as uh, Dipanjan, uh, as uh, Dipanjan also rightly brought out, and you have done a field work in Malaysia, uh, if you can bring out the views uh, from within Southeast Asia 
on China's Belt and Road. Why am I asking this? Because as uh, the panelists have also pointed out that this is not only India's extended neighborhood, but given India's uh, new uh, uh, Indo-Pacific vision, Act East forms the core of that. So I think knowing what the view is from Southeast Asia will be very important uh, uh, to, uh, given our recent Indo-Pacific vision as well, and also um, in particular in general our Act East policy. Besides that, I think the few questions that have been um, given to us, there are two questions which can be clubbed as one, is um, how India alone and uh, along with other Western countries uh, come up with an alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road, and that is possible. Our uh, second question is, as per several news articles published in 2020, companies blacklisted by the World Bank have received contracts under the CPEC project. In uh, light of this, why is there not much discussion on this issue? And how can other concerned governing agencies be held more accountable for proper implementation of the larger OBOR project? Um, so these are the questions. Uh, please, uh, the floor is all yours, Ike. Well, thank you so much for these thoughtful uh, responses. I wish that I had time left in our hour to respond to all of them uh, essentially, uh, effectively, but sadly, time is short. So. Let me zoom out and return to my original framing, which I, I, I want to reiterate, I think is the right approach. We need to diagnose the challenge before we prescribe solutions to it. And what, what has come out of this discussion, I think, are a few stylized facts that are worth restating simply. The first is that the Belt and Road Initiative has great, great uh, symbolic within China politics. It is linked to Xi Jinping. It has buy-in from across the Communist Party. This is not going anywhere. Second, as a slogan, it is flexible and vague. And China will keep redefining it until it is a success because it cannot be allowed to fail. It encompasses far more than infrastructure. It encompasses anything that China chooses to set its mind to. It has no clear geographic distinction and perhaps because there are so many domestic actors who want to tie themselves to the mast of the Belt and Road, it keeps expanding into new domains. The health domain, when China decides to distribute vaccines, the Arctic domain, when China, some Chinese universities and Northern provinces decide they want links to the Arctic. And so this will continue to grow uh, conceptually and geographically until the rest of the world decides what it is and how it wants to respond. Uh, the other point is that to recipient countries, uh, there will always be local actors who see a benefit from partnering with China. So this is, this is a long-term challenge to manage. There is no such thing as kicking Belt and Road permanently out of a country. Right now, for example, Maldives seems like it has pushed back more aggressively than any other country that was once a member of Belt and Road. But who knows if Maldives has another election and uh, allies of the former president Gayoom come back into power, we could see Maldives pivot back towards partners. So this is a long-term challenge, which affects basically every country in the world. And there will always be actors within those countries who are pushing for closer links to China. So this is, this is not something to which there is a permanent solution. This is a congenital new feature of the international order that we need to manage. Uh, and I think we've established that there is a security risk uh, for uh, the United States, but particularly for India, because India, I mean, the United States has seen a couple of countries in Latin America interact with China. It has seen some countries in the Caribbean accept Chinese investments, but it, it has, is much better, much more capable of defending itself from a naval perspective and of forcing China out of sensitive projects than India. Uh, and India sees itself potentially surrounded as countries from Nepal to Sri Lanka seek closer ties to China. So clearly a strategy is needed to compete, to be in the arena and to push back. The question is, what is our objective? What does success look like given that China is going to keep trying to invest, trying to develop political relationships and given that there will always be actors in these countries that see personal benefit from ties with China. The argument I make in the book is that the, the worst possible case scenario 
is that the Belt and Road evolves into an authoritarian, parallel geopolitical and technological bloc, which is uh, which organizes itself according to Chinese norms, which uh, is a force multiplier for Chinese national power and China's interests, and which is hostile not only to the United States and to India on a geopolitical level, but actually to our values, to our or to our institutions, to democracy, to human rights. And I think we see the beginnings of such an authoritarian bloc taking shape as China does partnerships with Russia uh, to develop uh, Beidou satellite infrastructure to compete with GPS. Uh, we see it in Huawei. We see it in the internationalization of the RMB in places like Guadar, uh, where China is trying to uh, separate its trading partners from the dollar financial system uh, so that they're no longer susceptible to US sanctions. And I think that as we design a policy and the United States and India must collaborate in this regard, our priority has to be disrupting the formation of a Chinese authoritarian geopolitical bloc. And part of that involves pushing back against Huawei. I think the Trump administration was actually right on this point. And part of it involves targeted interventions into countries that are on the fence to make sure that they don't lock themselves in. Uh, we should oppose RMB internationalization. We should offer countries, including Pakistan, alternatives uh, to Huawei. And th these are the domains in which we should be thinking. We are not going to shut China out of every coal power plant, every high voltage transmission line, every airport, every road. As horrific as it is to see prison laborers working on highways in Sri Lanka. Highways in Sri Lanka should not be our priority. We need to concentrate on the infrastructure that matters most and also the geopolitical cooperation, which might not actually build the building of stuff, but is just as important. We need to disrupt China's order building. This, I think, is a priority of the Biden administration. Build back better for the world is a clunky slogan. It has no money behind it. It is just words. Uh, but what it symbolizes is that the United States and the major industrialized countries are on the same page, that they need to be offering an alternative to countries that are contemplating long-term dependence relationships on China. And that's the way we need to think about this problem. I think if we grasp the big, uh, the big idea there, uh, policy towards specific countries in specific cases can follow naturally. I think uh, um, thanks, Ike. Uh, there is uh, one more question, um, which actually the questions are addressed to all the panelists. So if anybody is free to uh, come in and give their views on this. Uh, for instance, I think uh, even the panelists and even you had mentioned in your presentation about the transparency and credibility of these Chinese investments and accountability of these projects, basically. So a uh, question in line with that is, um, Given that the Chinese investments in the BRI is mainly driven by the Chinese organizations, uh, do you see any uh, chances in the future for them to do it in collaboration with other global organizations, which can probably provide it with a, a backing on transparency, basically? This is a very good question, and it's an important point. Um, I, One of my arguments in this book is that the Trump administration's strategy of calling the Belt and Road a death trap scheme is misleading because that is not actually describing the thought process that leads uh, partner countries to take money from China, to take loans from China. And it's, it's, it's denying the agency of the very sophisticated actors in places like Sri Lanka that choose to take out loans knowing that there are strings attached. Uh, that said, it does make very effective propaganda uh, from our side in terms of persuading countries that there might be long-term risks uh, from associating with China and committing to big strategic projects. So I think you could make the argument that even if the debt trap is not really an accurate description of most Belt and Road projects being built, it was a very effective uh, slogan uh, in leading, in giving many uh, pro- American or pro-Western or anti-Chinese actors in these uh, 
countries that are on the fence uh, a talking point when they were pushing back against uh, dependence on China. I think beyond that, uh, calling attention to Belt and Road projects that are really thought out, that are uh, involved in shady deals and graft uh, on the ground, that are uh, treating their workers poorly, uh, that's a, that, those are techniques that we can use to expose uh, the challenges and risks of interacting with China. Um, I don't think we should be, we, we should, we should leave it that this is enough uh, to call China out on its, on its abuses of power, because clearly uh, every, everyone knows how the Chinese do business. And at this point, a country that takes on a deal with China knows what it's getting into. Uh, but, but I think it is worthwhile pointing out. I also think that the most effective uh, asymmetrical ways that we can commit, we can compete with the Belt and Road is simply to offer external auditing uh, to say, hey, if you're a country that's considering doing a deal with China, we will make these lawyers and accountants and various uh, subject matter experts available to you so you can assess the project independently and figure out whether it's a worthwhile thing. And along those lines, if China proposes a project that is actually well thought out and going to be a win for everyone and not particularly threatening to our interests, I think we should encourage it to go ahead. Look, China being wealthy and powerful is just a fact of the international system. That's not going to change. And China will only become wealthier and more powerful over the coming years. What we should be doing is trying to create a pathway for China to leverage that wealth and power in a productive way for everyone. So we have to find certain use cases for China's uh, engineering expertise and Chinese capital. And if China is building roads in Angola, surely there is some way there is some way to do that in which it's good for everyone. So we need to be pushing back hard against cases that are excessive, that are hostile to our interests. But we need to accept that we cannot and should not try to compete everywhere. We should try to create opportunities for China to invest productively, following global best practices. And when it does, we should give them the recognition that it deserves. I think we have uh, two minutes left. Uh, would any of the panelists uh, like to give in their concluding remarks at this point? Uh, uh, about uh, about the Eurasia, uh, I, I, um, I, I believe that uh, you know um, we need we need to look at Russia China relationship a little more closely rather than painting it a very black and white. And I'm not saying this because, uh, you know, that uh, that I'm sitting in India and other pan panelists are sitting in India. And Sana all did not say this because she's uh, uh, a scholar of an Indian origin and India has historical uh, ties with, with Soviet Union and Russia. You know, of course, we are a democracy uh, uh, and a Westminster system which has very different relations with Moscow than many other uh, democracies have. Um, and 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 uh, I have found it difficult to explain it to many many scholars in the West or journalists in the West. That apart, you know, I'm not uh, you know I'm not arguing it, but I don't think the last word there has been said. Uh, Moscow is very worried with the Chinese encroachment in Far East Asia, uh, Far East Russia. Sorry, therefore wanted Japan, India, to and South Korea to play a big role there, and it's a demographic change which is happening there on the ground, right? Uh, in Central Asia, of course, it's considered it's, as its uh, backyard, uh, part of your former, you know, republics, where the the return of Taliban looms large, and and this time the return of Taliban in Kabul is going to have serious implications in in in, in Central Asia. Um, so uh, that that is uh, that that we have to look and. and Central Asian states like Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan may not be able to resist the Chinese pressure, but uh, there are, you know, but but I don't think so. Russia would like to give it a, a kind of a clean slate to to the to the Chinese, and the deal with each other, the China Iran deal also it's not very clear, you know, because I recently uh, found out an internal Chinese document, or partly reported in South China Morning Post, that uh, the Chinese don't have much hopes from the Iran. Uh, deal because of they are quoting ecological uh, you know ecological 
disturbances but my if i read between the lines it's more of the return from the loans or investments in that part of the world you know what thailand indonesia or vietnam can give them in return in in pure economic terms i don't think central asia and iran can do that for them right and there are plans of parallel uh, to to uh, you know to 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 the to the belt and road initiative including the chabahar you know we just need to kind of maybe uh, do a kind uh, a, a study on that that's a missing link of the of the indo pacific sort of thing you know uh, of a part of the indo pacific because because not many scholars i guess has been in the west has been kind of uh, focused on that you know probably because that may not be a part of a us focus i would say to be very frank and honest and given the us relations since they may not have really kind of saw it as as something which can move i know it's very difficult relations with iran is very difficult but we my i think it the last word hasn't been said like the last word in indonesia china relations hasn't been said the last word hasn't been said in eurasia and the russia china relations thank you um i think the discussion on bri even a day long one would not be enough um, given all the recent developments that have been happening not only surrounding bri but also the different alternate uh, initiatives that have been announced the b3w being one we, there's there's asia africa growth corridor blue dot there are so many others uh, where uh, countries are trying to come up with an alternative so uh, the discussion on this on this topic can go on uh but today we have run out of time and i would like to thank all my panelists uh, especially i uh, this is great work and please once uh, this book hits the floor please everybody should read it because it provides some very fresh new inputs on uh primary research which is very important uh, not only on paper mm. research in general um he has used some very good chinese sources and also other uh, authentic sources from within the country in their own language so please do give this a read uh, with that i would like to even thank our participants for joining in and um, see you for another discussion at orf thank you thank you